Good evening and welcome everyone to another exciting session on our biblical interpretation in Second Temple literature. Uh, to remind you, where we're at now is we're on the Pesharim, we're on the Pesher interpretation. What is the Pesher interpretation um, that we have in the Second Temple period? It's something that we only have from the Qumran community. Does this mean that only they were doing it? It seems like, it seems probable actually that either only they were doing it or only groups like them were doing it. Because what they're doing is they're taking biblical books and they're interpreting them as if they're speaking about the community itself or about, um, and, and the, you know, the time to come, they're, the history as well as the time to come. And they're really interpreting it to speak about groups during the second temple period. Uh, and that's unusual for uh, for biblical interpretation at this time, and it's uh, it's particularly unusual because it's actually a very it's a an interpretation of where it's citing the verse and saying, and this is what it means, as opposed to what we've been looking at until now, which is what we call rewritten Bible, when there's a retelling of the biblical story with no indication whatsoever of this is the biblical, or almost never, usually not an indication that this is the biblical verse and this is the interpretation. It's all kind of melded together. Here, on the contrary, it's very clear, or it's meant to be very clear, which is the biblical verse and which is our interpretation. Interpretation being pesher, pesher connected to the word that we're used to, patar, pe, tough reish. Um, the, the tough and the shin are, uh, I, I, I forgot the right uh, term for it, but they're, they're connected sounds so that that's one of the uh um, that's one of the consonants that is kind of can be interchangeable when you switch uh, cognate languages um so that pesher is is the solution the interpretation we have this similar language in daniel um now we looked uh, last week at pesher Chavakuk, um which talked about certain specific uh um uh, happenings that happened to the community and the wicked priest who perhaps could he could it be um Alexander Yanai who was both king and priest could it be someone else um it 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 someone who seemed to actively interfere in the group's uh celebration of their Yom Kippur because it was not the correct date um very similar to what we as to certain famous rabbinic arguments now we're going to kind of dive into Pesher Nachum, looking at an interpretation of Nachum, which is a different one of it, which is a different minor prophet, minor prophet because they are short, not because they are not important. And um, and so we're going to dive into this. I'm going to let's take a look at our handout, and I'm going to use. Uh, in terms of the interpretation, our interpretation of the Pesher and talking about it, I'm going to rely pretty heavily on Shani Baron Soref's work. Maybe some of you know Shani. Um, she wrote the definitive uh, volume on Pesher Nachum um, in terms of both the critical edition and interpretation. She also, if you want to have something a little bit shorter, what we have left of Pesher Nachum is not a lot. Um, so if you want, if you have access to the um, outside the Bible volumes, she also did the commentary in that. And that's a little bit more accessible because it doesn't go deep in. Her book is very, very in-depth. Okay, so but let's uh, let's dive into Pesher Nachum. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share my screen on the handout that I gave you. All right, so here we have, um, um, it, it's very it's very fragmented. So this is kind of where we actually have something closer to whole lines in this um, in this in this um, um, work. Now, as as Shani uh, Baron Sorev points out, um, the um, as opposed, it's not it's not taking each verse where we we looked at Pesach Kavakuk, Each verse was kind of taken on its own. In this case, there is kind of a thematic connection between the original text and the way it's being interpreted. So what you have in the original text, let me go into Enachum. Is it's a Enachum is a book that's really talking about Assyria and how horrible they are. Okay, so if we look, um, so if we're looking um, Assyria. 
um, and how and their downfall. Okay, so um, and here what we have is is Syria is actually interpreted to, and I'm here uh, following Shan, Shani's uh, interpretation. Um, uh, and again, I I mean no, she's no disrespect to her. You know, she's a tremendous scholar. I maybe would call her I don't know uh, Doctor Baron Sarif, but I know her, so it's it's hard for me to do that. So if I call her Shani, it means no disrespect to her. Um, so so Shan, what what um. As Shani interprets it, um, this is talking, and it's also pretty clear, is that what you're doing is you're interpreting it as talking kind of kind of the Jerusalem, um, the Jerusalem um, um, uh, establishment, right? In other words, we're not talking about Assyria anymore so much, with certain exceptions. Well, not Assyria. We're not talking about um, non-Jews, even though we are in certain cases. Um, we're more talking about the conflicts between Jewish groups. So let's dive in, okay? Asher halach ari lavi sham gur arye ve'en machrid, ve'en macharid, this is, this is um, restored based on the verse, okay? Um, where, the, where the lion went to bring the lion's cub and there was none to frighten, what is its interpretation? Again, this is reconstructed. Pisharo, um, Demetrius, king of Greece, who sought to come upon Jerusalem at the council of the seekers after smooth things. Who are the seekers after smooth things? So what what is what's going on here? So we're talking we're talking about Demetrius the third, who ruled from ninety four to eighty eight B C E, um, and he battled Alexander Yanai in eighty eight B C E because there was a Jewish faction that called to him to come in. That's as that's as Josephus describes, okay? So according to Josephus, Demetrius came and fought with Alexander Yanai, again, at the Council of the Seekers after Smooth Things. He was called, af he was called for by a group of Jews in Jerusalem itself, all right? Now, who are these Seekers after Smooth Things? Um, in general, they're considered to be connected to the Prushim, right? The, what we normally in English call the Pharisees. Um, there, it's also used in other contexts in Hodayot, in the Damascus document, sometimes simply talk, and not talking about those who aren't accepting the community stringencies. It's not always clear that it's always talking about Pharisees. Um, in general here, it is connected later specifically with in, in this document, in the Peshanachim, it's connected specifically with the Prushim. So these seekers after smooth things, and let's go to the Hebrew, Dorshei HaChalakot, right? Um, and, and some say Dorshei here, Prushim, you know, the, these, they, and they're, they, they're Doresh things, right? They interpret, in, legally interpret things so that it'll be easier for them. So they're seekers after smooth things. Um. In the kings of Greece from Antiochus until the rising of the rulers of the Kitim and afterwards will be trampled. So the um, the I, the um, 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 idea seems to be that it didn't what what it's normally considered to be missing here. We're missing a whole part of a line here that it did not in fact fall to Demetrius. And what's probably being said here. Is that it didn't fall to it didn't fall to um, Demetrius just as it hadn't hadn't fallen to previous kings, all right? Um, it, it, you know, since since the Babylonians, right? Um, um, and afterwards will be trampled. We don't know what it's saying. Um, and then we have the verse: the lion tears at his cubs and strangles his lionesses for prey. What is the interpretation for this one? Upon the young lion of wrath who will smite his great ones and the men of his council. So this is Demetrius is fighting Alexander Yanai. Alexander Yanai is this young lion of wrath. In other words, the young lion of wrath is going to succeed against Demetrius. Now I want now, so that was, in other words, when Nahum was stated, this was a prophecy regarding what would happen, right? with Demetrius versus um, Alexander Yanai. Alexander Yanai, um, Alexander Janais, um, he is the first one of the Hashmonaim of the Hasmonean kings who his who, whose coins 
explicitly say that he is both the king and the high priest and the Kohen Gadol. So he has a kind of a special status. Um, as uh, as is a famous um, and interesting distinction, um, whereas in the whereas in rabbinic Judaism, the problem with the Hasmoneans is that they were kings despite being priests. The problem that um, the Qumran community has is more that they were priests despite being kings and not being from the line of Tzedek. So um, the Qumran community had no problem with them being kings, um, but they weren't crazy that they were high priests when they weren't from the correct line. Whereas um, the rabbinic uh, tradition has problems with them being kings given they're priests and you shouldn't be both. Um, anyway, so this is talking about when, and again, here we have to fill in from Josephus, right? So Josephus talks about Yanai uh, crucifying his opponents after he, after Demetrius leaves uh, Judea. Um, and, um, and he says he killed, and he says he killed the men along with their wives and children, um, while the king and his consorts watched. So that seems to be here um, on the secrets after smooth things. It's not clear I, what it seems to be is these are, and this in this story, the opponents of Alexander Yanai, right? Those secrets after smooth things, remember they're the ones who called Demetrius in. So he hang, and he, he will hang people alive. All right. So it's interpreting what it's saying in terms of Assyria um, as speaking about this art, this fight between Demetrius and Alexander Yanai and Asher Yitzle and Ashim Chaim, that he will hang people alive. And that's those um right? He will hang because to hang them live on the tree, right? Um here and of Israel 44 of one hanged alive on the tree is to be read. Okay, and here's another verse. Hineni elecha nu umashem svaot viv arti bashan rufka. So, in other words, what is if we go back to our biblical verse here? Forward it is. Here it's Hinani Elaif, excuse me. Hinani Elaif, no Uma do Nights for Oath with Arti Bashan Rifpa, Ukhiraif, Tokal Kharev, the Fratim Eris Tarpech, Veloishama Odkal, Kol Mal Acheche, right? Um, that I am going to deal with you. I will burn you, I will burn down its chariots. I will, um, the sword, uh, so here the sword will devour. Um, your, your great beast, more like your, your, um, I would, I would, I would uh, interpret it as also in terms of lions, right? And I will, I will stamp out your prey from the earth, right? And this is kind of uh, talking about that it's not just the lions. It's not just the um, here. If we go back, that's also what it's interpreting here. That a lion is going to kill both its. Uh, it's it, it's it's interpreting it differently. Let's go back here. Let's go back to our verse here. Okay. So what is it saying? Um, um, what is the lion tears at his cubs and strangles his lionesses for prey? That's not what the original verse means. The original verse means that a lion will tear things for its cubs to feed its cubs, right? And instead, it's being interpreted here as the lion will kill the cubs and kill the lionesses because the lion is Alexander Yanai, and the lionesses and cubs are the wives and children of his enemies, okay? Um, and the fact that they are hanged alive on the trees shows that God is against them as an interpretation of the verse in Nachum, okay? And again, um, um, and, and, the, and also the idea that uh, its interpretation, your multi, they are the legions of his army and his young lions, they are his great ones and his prey, it is the wealth which the priests of Jerusalem amass that they will give it. And the idea, there's also an idea in, in Pesha Chavakuk that uh, the wealth of that the priests have amassed in Jerusalem or that has been amassed from the nations in Jerusalem will end up being looted by the nations. And the idea, again, this is the idea that 
things are, have gone wrong in the Jerusalem, um, in the in the uh, Jerusalem uh, administration, right? And in the administra administration of the temple. Now, Ephraim here is another reference to the Prushim. Okay, it's a more explicit reference to the Prushim. The seekers after smooth things can be non-Prushim who are simply against whatever the community considers important. The Ephraim seems to be the Prushim and Menasha in general is considered to uh, be, and we'll see Menasha a little bit later, Menasha is considered to be um, the Stokim, the Sadducees, um, and Aristobulus. So let's uh, let's continue again. There isn't that there isn't that much of this. You're like, oh no, we're only we we've already used half an hour. There just isn't that much of Pesha Nachum. Um, I'm going to pause here before we continue because I'm doing this a little bit quickly. If anyone has comments or questions. So what's the actual history? What happened? Did did Yainai, did Alexander Yane actually crucify people? Or yeah, did not? Well, quite look. We're we're relying on Josephus here. Josephus talks about him crucifying people. Yeah, it's we can look it up. It's an Antiquities thirteen three eighty. Right. So it's um and it's interesting because it biblically, in general, and I to say oh this is the rabbinic interpretation. I I think it's also I think it's also the plain meaning is in general people aren't killed by hanging. If when hanging is part of the punishment, it's after they're dead. In other words, their bodies are are kind of up there for people to see for X amount of time, for a limited amount of time, right? Um, but it seems that, in fact, Alexander Yanai did do this to his opponents, specifically in this case, right? Specifically in this case where um, where he was fighting um, Demetrius III, um, and then once Demetrius III was essentially defeated, he, he crucified his opponents. And again, we're relying on Josephus here. Mm -hmm. um, but who else would we rely on, right? Who else would, we don't have, excuse me, we don't have anyone else. So that's that's what we're going with. And mm -hmm. frankly, this works with that. This seems to, this seems to be pretty clearly um, um, supporting that idea, particularly as uh, as it tells us specifically that we're talking about, well, I mean, it, it's, we're, we're, we are, we are um, um, filling in part of Demetrius, right? If you look at what we actually have, we have trios. We have the trees here, right? And the 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 demi we have to kind of restore. Um, at the same time, we are talking about the king of Greece, right? Mian Malchayavan. Actually, no, I shouldn't say that because kings of Greece is talking about from Antiochus, but here he's talking about the king of Greece. When it's Demetrius, king of Greece, so it's it's it works that it's Demetrius, um, and it works that that's what we're talking about again. Um, as when, whenever we're talking about historical events, we're trying to find a parallel, especially when it's something that very specific that only um, only Jews will care about. <laughs> um, um, Josephus is is the source usually for historical events. Um, so yeah. Um, any other questions before I continue? Okay. So uh, what we're seeing here, and I do want to take us. So what? What we when we when we looked at Pesach Habakkuk, we talked about this idea of them being very kind of um, embattled, right? That that there's this um, 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 that there's this idea they have that um, here they are, and there's this wicked priest, and he's coming after them, and they've got this righteous teacher, and they're you know they, they're they're in a in a state of conflict. We see this here on being kind of presented on a more, I wouldn't say global scale, but on a larger scale, right? You have these groups that are opposing them and that will be punished, okay? And it's, and it's connected not just to them, but they're also connected to what's going on in Jerusalem in general. So for example, this whole, this whole conflict with Alexander Yanai, who at one point they seem to be actually, it, it's very possible that Qumran that the Qumran community, and I, 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 when I say Qumran community, I do mean even those who weren't at Qumran. I don't think they were necessarily all at Qumran or only at Qumran or Qumran for their entire for the entire time that they existed. But when I say, so the, but I think the Qumran community um, at at a certain point had a lot of had a great hope from Alexander Yan. They did not. They were hoping that he would kind of see the light and see that their rule that their rules were correct. Um, so going back to our text. Um, um, okay, and his 
uh, okay, I'm just going to go to, to, um, um, yeah, let's, let's go. So from now we're in column two, um, and it's saying, um, uh, this is, this is interesting because it's not, it's not, <laughs> oh, I see. Cause I don't have, I'm sorry. I don't have the top. I don't have the first line of the Hebrew here. My mistake. Okay. Um, so it's, um, uh, Sharo, it's, it's interpretation. He, ear Ephraim, what are we talking about here? Um, woe city of blood. All right. So if we go back to our text, let's try and find this here. Here we are. Hoi ear damim. Okay. Woe city, city of blood. Again, this is translated city of crime. It's city of murder. Um, right. Kula kachash perak loya mishtaref. It's just filled with lies and treachery, okay? Uh, filled with violence that the, the prey, in other words, the killing does not, is never removed from it, okay? Um, what is this city of, of crime? This city of crime is Jerusalem, okay? So the Jerusalem is, its interpretation, she is the city of Ephraim. The seekers after smooth things at the end of days that they will conduct themselves in deception and falsehood. Okay. That this is, and this is important. The Qumran community sees themselves as existing at the end of days. They are in the last period, right? This is what they're talking about. They're talking about now. Okay, this city of Ephraim, which is the city where the Pushim are in power, where the Pharisees are in power. Okay, they are the secrets after smooth things. In the end time, they're just going to be completely just lying. They're just walking in lies. They're just constantly lying. Okay. Um, loyal motion. Here we have another quote. Loyal motion. Terror for cold shots, for rash, often with sus. Um, the harm of Kavamak. I'm sure I'm saying this. Let me read, read the actual here. Cold shots, the cold rash, often with sus to hair. Right, so still here. America, America, Keda. Let's see if they the um. Let's go back to our first Vesus do hair, and it 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 dropped. Um, 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 and, and so so essentially, what and what do we have here? Um, and here you have the translation. All it's actually war. It's going on with all the sorts of America, America, da, um, America, da, America, America, da, um, um. And and horses and uh, so we have we have um, I don't like predation again it's it's uh, no killing and the sound of the whip and the sound of the of the chariot wheel and the and the galloping horses and the and the chariot and the uh, and the and the horsemen and the flame and and the spear um, and all the rope. Um, uh, Barak Hanit, the flash of the spear, Barak Halal, and many, many killed. Uchvod um, Peger and all, all, the, all the corpses. Ve'en Kates, Ve'en Kates, look, via. there's no end to the corpses. Ve'kashlu, um, Uchviatam, Uchviatam, and what is the actual verse here? Ve'kashlu, uh, Uchviatam. And they should stumble over bodies. Um, and so this just this tremendous amount of dead, this is what's going to happen to them. This this war and this dead. Um, and it's interesting that here you have a vav instead of a bed, the Kashlu big viatam, right? Um, so its interpretation concerns the domain of the seekers after smooth things. Now, what what it's actually translating here. Oh, this got a little bit reversed because the vakat. The vakat should be here, and then here's memshelet. Psharo uh, al memshelet. Yeah, um, yeah, this is terrible. Dorshea halakot. These are all. All these words are reversed. Okay, there's a vakat here. The vakat here is a space that was left. No one wrote vakat. There's a space that was left to indicate the end of the verse, and it's so the the again the petra the way the petra is written is that. They want to ensure that you know what's a quote and what isn't, right? So it finishes this quote, it leaves a space. And this is and now Upisharo, and this it got it got a uh, reverse here. Upisharo and its interpretation is Al Memshelet Dorshea Halakot on the dominion 
of those the secrets after smooth things. Asher lo yamush mikarev elatem cherev goyim that the there that from their community will not be removed the sword of nations. Now hold on just a second. I want to say a couple things on this. Memshelat is the rule. Okay, the rule, the dominion of these secrets after smooth things. Now, if we're still talking about Ephraim is the Prushim, the secrets after smooth things here are the Prushim, are essentially the Pharisees, then what we have is um, the dominion, right, is when they're in charge. This might be under Shlom Tzion, Alexander Yanai's wife, who again, we're going with Josephus here, but it makes sense that under Shlom Tzion, they were absolutely put in charge. Okay, where the Pushim are in charge under Shlom Tzion. At the very least, this is the period that they're talking about. When they say the end of days, it seems pretty clear they're talking about kind of now. Right now is the time when these Pushim, these seekers after smooth things, have dominion. They have rule. That rule is going to end. And the punishment is going to be war with the nations. All right. Now, it's always interesting to talk a bit about um, in terms of how much these, um, so this this scroll dates from the script to about first century BCE, okay? Um, and this, all this stuff that was happening, Shlom, if, if we're talking about Shlom Tzion though, we're talking about close to the, you know, we're, um, it, it's, um, it's going up, let's see, Shlom Tzion is, she ruled from 76 to 67 BCE. Um, and and what we're seeing is this general, because people have asked, like, what's the connection between the Qumran community and the revolt against Rome, right? And the answer is, what we see in Qumran writings is this, and not just in Qumran writings, is this general feeling of we are moving towards a cataclysmic battle because this state of, of this state of things cannot be allowed to continue. And... First of all, and, and that's on two different and two different ways. From the point of view of the Qumran community, this rule that doesn't recognize their law as the correct one can't possibly stand, especially since it's so clear that they are right and doesn't God and God knows they're right. So how can that be? So that's that's got that's got to change. Also, there's a general feeling that no other nation should be ruling over the land of Israel. Right, no foreign nation should be ruling over the land of Israel. We see that especially, and we'll talk about it when we come back to Jubilee, to the Book of Jubilees later. We see it very much in the first chapter of the Book of Jubilees. This idea that foreign rule is almost like demonic rule, like you have foreign rule. Now again, this is very much a Judean point of view. This is not a point of view of the Jews that are in the diaspora. Right. If you look at the books of the Maccabees and the book of second, comparing first Maccabees and second Maccabees in the book of second Maccabees, it's considered OK to have foreign rule in the land of Israel as long as everything, as long as we can worship and we can do what we need to do and we have a certain amount of autonomy. Um, but um, in increasingly in in this um um, there's an idea in Judea in particular, well, I, I mean, I mean, also I, I assume in the Galilee, in the Galilee it's not such a problem because Judea becomes, right, after, after um, uh, Pompeii, uh, uh, the general, um, you know, that, that the battle of, um, the battle where um, Jerusalem is essentially lost, and that, I believe, that's 67 BC, um, after that, Judea becomes a direct Roman protectorate, right? So Judea becomes, as opposed to the Galilee, which is kind of a vassal state, it, Judea is a direct Roman protectorate. So you've got this weird situation where you've got the temple standing, but you and, the, and worship in the temple, but this is a Roman territory, right? And that, if the, as you have these kind of things of like, no, that, how can that be, especially in Jerusalem, um, this must be coming to an end. Now you hear, again, we're, we're still talking in the first century BCE with this, with this text, but you do see this idea of we are coming up to a cataclysmic battle with the nations. Now, of course, we see this also in the war scroll, which we won't really be discussing this year because it's not really biblical interpretation so much. Um, 
but um, um, the war school where this idea of there's going to be this big cataclysmic battle, but there's so many, so many Jews, not just the Qumran, have this expectation of this kind of apocalyptic, either just and you know magical kind of like you know, spiritual ending of evil or an actual battle, right? And that battle involves the nations and the, and the, and the standard model of the day of Yom Hashem, right? The day of the Lord, where there's this big battle with the nations and the wicked and the righteous. And the, like in, 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 in the prophets, in the biblical prophets, it's generally nations and, and Israel, right? Are involved in this, in this battle. And once we get to the second temple period, there's more of this kind of like, oh, and the wicked, there's the wicked and the righteous. And, and that kind of comes into play. Um, okay. Going back to our text. So here, we have this idea that there's going to be a war, right? Where these seekers after smooth things are going to fall, right? They shall not cease from the midst of their congregation, the sword of the Gentiles, captivity and plunder and fever among them and exile from fear of the enemy. And a multitude of guilty corpses will fall in their days and there shall be no end to the sum of their slain. And even over their fleshly bodies, they shall stumble by their guilty counsel. So if we look back, let's look at the Hebrew. Okay. Um, here it's being very specific, saying, saying, hey, this verse is just about them. And we're going to tell it, we're even going to quote the words so you understand that every single word is, is going to come true here. Right. Um, 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 it, it, it's, um, um, and, and it adds exile, right? Um, uh, an exile from fear of the enemy. And many corpses of guilt. In other words, why are they going to fall? Because of their sin. Uh, will fall in their days. There's no end to the number of their dead. Now here it adds something because in this in the verse that it's quoting, it says, and they shall stumble over their corpses, over the dead. Right. And that's talking about all the dead. That's what the verse means, right? But they're gonna say, no, they are gonna stumble, but it's they're gonna stumble because of their flesh, gvia as in body, not as in corpse. Right, they're going to stumble because of their flesh. in their body of flesh, they will stumble. in the in the um, thoughts of their guilt, merov znune zona. To um um oh, and now and now we're going to go straight into straight into um they're going to stumble because of their bodies, because of their flesh. And we're going to go right into verses talking about using the metaphor of a of a witch or a a an, a um a prostitute for Assyria, which is what Nahum has. Nahum has this whole thing about how what's going to happen to Assyria is like what happens to a um, a witch or a um, so let's, uh, 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 to a witch slash, um, I guess you could say harlot, right? But um, the idea is, and, and, and where she's kind of stripped in front of everyone and um, and punished, that's in Nahum, okay? Um, and here we're going right in, they're gonna stumble, right? Because of their bodies, right? And then we go right into a verse that's talking about the harlotries of the harlot, right? Um, so because of the many harlotries of the harlot, and this is a quote, charmingly pleasing, a mistress of sorceries who betrays nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. So here if we have um uh nune zona tovachen ubalak shafim hamimakeret goyim biznuta umishbachot big shafeha, right? From the many harlotries of harlot the harlot, whatever. Zune zona, the harlotries, right? Um, and but she's pretty, right? Tovachen, and she has sorceries, right? She has sorceries that essentially um um capture nations 
with her harlotry and families with her witchery. Okay. What is its interpretation? Pishro. Al mat e Ephraim. Okay. There it's the, the interpretation is on the misleaders, those who mislead of Ephraim. What does that mean? What are these misleaders doing? They're like a seductive woman who are seducing people through their false teaching. Okay, seducing them from the law that should be, which is the law of the community, right? That's the law of the community. So we have um um uh, Ephraim. Um um this is oh, this all got reversed again because of Vakat. Um a share betalmud. This is too bad that you don't see it in Hebrew. You have to read it in reverse if you can. A share betalmud shkaram. Vilashon Kizbehem um Usvat Mirma Yitu Yitu Rabim. I okay, I just read that whole thing backwards. Uh, so you can follow me backwards if you want to read reading that in the learning of their lies, in the teaching rather of their lies and the language again of their deceptions. Um, and the also the language of their again another language for, for Mirma also deception. Um, they will lead astray many. Okay, so uh, it's interesting here that we have Asher b'Talmud Shkaram that in the teaching of their lies. Now, of course, Talmud Talmud is what we call the Gemara that comes from what we relate to the Prushim, right? Is this a kind of an an extra little reference to the Prushim to the uh, excuse me to the Prushim? When it calls what they're teaching Talmudan, their Talmud, it's too far away to know. There's too great a, a, a gap between the Second Temple period and the Talmud to say, oh yeah, this is a reference to the Talmud, right? But it's who knows, right? We don't know when when uh, the Prushim started calling what they were doing Talmud. Maybe who knows, right? Um, but the idea is that they mislead people with their false teaching, okay? Um, um, they say their lying tongue and their wily lip. I wouldn't say they're wild. It's not, it's it's their lying language. Um, it's not their, I wouldn't say they're lying. It's again, like we have to do this in in, in reverse here. It's all backwards. A lishon kizvehem is the language of, language of their lies. Usvat lashon and safa can be both well, lit, it's, uh, are both used for language. So it's really talking the language. They're speaking. They're speaking um, um, lies. Um, kings, princes, priests, and populace together with the resident alien. In other words, who is being misled? Everyone. Everyone from the king to the ger, right? To the ger toshav. So here again, melachim, um, sarim, kohanim, Ve'am im ger nilva, um, um, nilva arim um uh, uh, nil, ger im ger nilva. In other words, kings, officers, priests, nations, and even the resident alien. Everyone is being kind of seduced by these seekers after smooth things who are misleading them in terms of the correct law. Okay. Arim um mishpachot yovedo batatam. Um, right, cities and families will be will will be lost, will be destroyed rather because of their uh, device or their uh, advice or their schemes. Um, honored people and rulers will fall from the from the anger that results from their from their tongues. Um, and um, and here again we have there's a vakat here. So again, I'm going to be reading this in reverse. Uh, this is this is again a a quote. Hineni elayich neum Hashem, Hashem tzvaot vig ah vig um vig it's either vigaliti or vigalat shulayich al panayich. This is talking about. Let me go back to the verse here, and this is the punishment. Okay, so they have been seducing everyone. They're like this seductive witch, right? Who's you know that they are seducing everyone from the highest to the lowest with their way of looking at things, with what they think should be done. And of course they're wrong and they are going to be punished. 
Okay, what is going to happen? Here's the verse. Here's the original verse. Hinani life noam Hashem noam Hashem tzvaot vegileti shulayich al panayich vaharati goyim ma'arich umam lachot kilonech. I am against you, says God, and I am going to um, show your. Essentially, I'm going to lift up. So I'm going to lift up your skirts over your face. I'm going to strip you. Right. And I'm going to show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. Now, what does that mean? And by the way, in terms of Nahum, the actual book, so many interpret this as, oh, OK, so now we know a little bit more about how they would deal with these women in how they would punish these women is that that's one of the things that they would possibly do when they have, let's say, a witch, someone they considered was someone who was doing sorcery, they would strip her in the public square to shame her. Okay, we don't have this in the Torah so much, but we seem to have evidence of it here. Um, and that's what it seems to be referring to. And it's saying, it's relating that to Assyria, right? Where it's saying, this is what God is going to do to Assyria. Assyria is going to bring down Assyria and reveal its shame to the nations. Okay, that is what Nahum is saying. Let's go back to what our text is saying. So the way our text is interpreting it is that okay it's interpretation huh? array hamizra right it's the cities of the east it's not super clear right um hagoyim benidatam uvishikut se to avotehem it, it's possibly saying that there's going to be an invasion from the cities of the east it's not really clear and it's going to, the nations are going to see their impurity and their disgusting abominations Okay, that's the original verse. Okay, I'm going to throw disgusting things on you and I'm going to make you essentially uh, disgusting and I'm going to make a spectacle out of you and everyone who sees you will recoil from you. Okay. And it's, again, it's talking here, it's talking about Assyria. And if we go back to our verse here, and I will cast in this great, and I will make you despicable, and all who see you will flee from you. Um, its interpretation concerns the seekers after smooth things. Right. That in the end of days, at the end time, their evil deeds will be revealed to all of Israel. Right? That's when everyone's going to understand that they've been sinning. They're going to hate them, be disgusted with them for the, the sin of, for their sinning. And this is revealed. And this is revealed. Uh, yeah, um, um, oh, I see this. Book. This is how she, this is. This is actually. Um, so I'm gonna re reread that. Um, ubi galot kvod Yehuda yadudu ptae Ephraim mitoch kahalam vazvu et matehem vinilvu al Yisrael. And when the glory of Yehuda is revealed, Yehuda probably either the community or just the the correct. Israel, quote unquote, the correct Yehuda, but one assumes the community. When that is revealed, they will um, they will essentially um, get uh, the the um, the fools of Ephraim. Okay, will the fools of Ephraim again? Ephraim. Um, so the fools of Ephraim will leave them. Right, will leave leave their their community. Mitochalam. And they will leave those who have led them astray, right? Pita'e Ephraim, like Shomer Pita'im Hashem, you know, God shelters, you know, God takes care of fools. So it's here, it is kind of fools, but it means that they're, they're the, here, it's really a simple one, it's simple ones, fools, um, people who were taken in. They, they should, normally they wouldn't have been the seekers after smooth things. They weren't the leaders, but they were taken in by these ideas. They will leave their community they will leave those who led them astray and they will join themselves to Israel. 
Israel, and they will join themselves to Israel. The Amrushu Dudan Ninve, this is again a quote, and um, and they shall say Ninve is um uh, is despoiled, is robbed. Me um me Yanudla me ayin avaksha minachamim lach. Who will who will uh, mourn for who will kind of not mourning? And where will I find mourners for you, comforters for you rather? Um, what is its interpretation? Pshero doshe hachalakot she tovad atzatam v'nif v'nifreda nifreda knesatam v'lo yosipu od lit od kahal uptaim lo yichasku od od et 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 atzatam. This is talking about those secrets after smooth things that their um their council will be lost, right? And their assembly will be broken up, and they will no longer be able to lead the community and these simple people astray. They, 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 will, no, they will not be able to lead the community astray, and simple people will no longer listen to their counsel. All right. So this thing, which is, oh, this is the fall of Assyria, becomes the fall of the secrets after smooth things, becomes the fall of the Prushim, the Pharisees, and the people who are in control in Jerusalem. They will no longer be able to lead the simple astray, and we can kind of see. And here in the in the continuation, we can see. Um, let me just make sure that there's oh, there's still more. But I think this is this is less uh, interesting. I'm just going to do this quickly. So we have a reference to Menashe, and Menashe, everyone under people still understand as the Sadducees that still came, as the Sadducees, right? And that, and also an indication, and also um, uh, connected to Aristotle. So, if we do this quickly in uh, in English, okay, um, are you better than Ammon situated among the rivers? Its interpretation: Ammon is Menasha, and the rivers are the nobles of Menasha, the honored ones of something. Um, and it's and it's the idea is that these are the Sadducees. The Stokim who are not with the community, right? These are, they're also not the right group, right? Um, the house, they are the wicked ones. If we're talking about uh, put and the Libyans where your helpers were put and the Libyans, they are the wicked ones of some group of Beit Peleg. It's some group that seems to have broken off. It's elsewhere talking about it. They broke off from the Qumran community. You got to keep on calling them the Qumran community, but it's the community described in the scrolls. Um, they broke off from the Qumran community and they joined themselves to Menasha. They joined themselves to the Sadist. Okay. Now they also, Menasha is also going to be punished at the end of this. Okay. So here, um, even she went into exile. Also her young children were dashed to pieces. Its interpretation concerns Menasha at the final age when his kingdom will be brought low. His women, his infants, and his children will go into captivity. His warriors and his nobles by the sword. Okay, um, and, and then this is this is a reconstruction, but the saying that its interpretation concerns the evil ones of Ephraim that their cup will come after Menashe. In other words, both the Pharisees and the Sadducees will be punished. Now, of course, we do have to say that the idea that Menashe must be the Sadducees is really almost completely um, relying on this idea that we have three sects: the Essenes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. This idea was really taken, stretched to its limits when the Dead Sea Scrolls were first uh, discovered and interpreted. So when the Dead Sea Scrolls were first discovered and interpreted, uh, Pesher Nachum among them, um, it was naturally um, it was naturally understood that when, if we're talking about large groups, who are the large groups going to be? It's the Qumran community who are the Essenes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. So if the Pharisees are Ephraim, which makes sense, um, and the secrets of the smooth things are some group in that connected to that thing. It's natural that, of course, who are the Menashe going to be? They're going to be the Sadducees. There is not that much in Peshanachum to indicate that these must be the Sadducees. At the same time, we don't have another great theory, right? We don't have another theory that works super well. And in general, everyone still interprets Menashe here as referring to the Sadducees. Okay. Um, so, what do we see in this text that we've been looking at? Um, and I will, uh, I see that there are some comments and questions. I will address them soon. Um, um, the, and if you have any more comments and questions, please add them now so that I will see them. Um, so the, the, what we've seen is that, again, you've got a community 
that said that firmly believes that we have the correct law. We are doing the right thing. We are seeing ourselves within the context of history because we're seeing ourselves is in the context of battles between Alexander Yanai and Demetrius and these larger groups of Jews with power in Jerusalem. But the fact is that these people who are in power have been misleading everyone. They've been misleading their own people. They've been misleading from the kings to the resident aliens. Everyone, everyone has been misled by these guys. They all think they're right. But in the end time, they are going to get theirs Everyone will see their nakedness and their shame. Everyone will see that they are wrong. We are right. And the simple ones from this group, from what really seems to be the Prushim, the Pharisees, this, the, the ones who have simply been kind of swept away by their um, kind of seductive arguments will realize the right thing and they will join us, right? We, of course, will be victorious. They will suffer the nations will destroy them. Uh, it's not super clear when it's talking about all the dead bodies and all the war, the extent to which they really expect them to be killed. Certainly one of the things that they expect is for everyone to recognize that these guys were wrong, that these guys are, their interpretation is wrong. We are correct and they will join us. Um, that is something that uh, is a is a repeating theme in many different ways in different different uh, different Quran documents. Uh, what we don't see here, by the way, and again, this is also goes this also connects to things that um, there are differences in the scrolls in terms of the way they're seeing the world, possibly connected to different stages of the community. Um, but in this, you're not seeing them saying, "Hey, they're following demonic influence. They're basically evil. There's something demonic inside them." They're just bad people, right? They're bad people. They're bad leaders. They're bad leaders who are misleading everyone else. So the everyone else is kind of given an out. The everyone else can escape. They can just realize it's the it's the it's the fault of the leaders. There's a very similar um, kind of explanation presented in Damascus document, um, and that is in contrast, for example, to the community rule that people cite a lot, um, where you have the um, the the lot of Blial and the lot of God, where these these guys belong to the lot of Blial, where you're saying, hey, they belong to the lot of a demon, and that seems to indicate there's something basically bad about them, or basically they can't cross over. Um, similarly, if we look at this, where it's the way it's talking about battles is, yes, they're going to be absolutely punished, but they're also going to be revealed to be fraudsters. Because they will be revealed to be fraudsters, the simple people will leave them. They will They will kind of cross the picket line and they will come over to us and they will be saved, right? Um, in, in, the, in the war scroll, it's a, an apocalyptic battle where the lines are set. There's our camp and there's the enemy camp and they're just battles now. Now we're going to have battles until someone wins. Um, so if there are different views of how this is going to play out, and again, possibly indicating different stages of the community's kind of lifetime where there was a stage where they were more accepting that, hey, people are just misguided. They just haven't had it explained to them. And maybe other times when they felt more persecuted and at that time said, hey, these guys are basically evil. They've got, they're following, they're in a demonic camp. You know, they can all literally go to hell, right? Um, so that's uh, possibly what we're seeing here. Uh, and now I will take questions. Um, so here we have, uh, let me let me go into our chat. Um, so Moshe asked, why is the text backwards? The text is backwards because of a problem when I was copying, I was copying from a certain uh, database, a, a Qumran database. And when you copy it from that database, it all looks fine in the original. But as soon as you have a vakat written in English in the middle of the line, when you copy it over, it reverses the rest of the line. That was why it was backwards. It has nothing to do with the original scroll. I had to read it backwards because that's what I had in front of me. It's normally, you know, I, I normally I catch it in this one. I, I didn't, I, I missed it. So um, that's what happened there. Any other questions or comments? Yes. 
there's something kind of admirable about the the totality of their vision and their view of how right they are and and it's very creative taking these these prophets and interpreting it in their own way. I mean, this is this is I don't know. I give it credit for creativity. No, there's and a tremendous amount of creativity. There's a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of thought that goes into their approach, and they mm -hmm. really believe they're right. Yeah. And there are arguments that they have that are pretty good, right? There are arguments mm -hmm. that they have where they're like, "Hey, can't you realize that this verse?" I like. I always like cite. We'll, we'll look into. When we look into the Damascus document in depth later, we'll look at where they're talking about um, kind of gendered language that that the the where it says you can't marry your aunt, it obviously also means you can't marry your uncle, and it's simply using the masculine to mean. But like it, like like it's like it's like no, it means it clearly means both, right? And it and it and they managed to kind of convey that, and it's a good argument. Um, like, hey, it's obvious that you're supposed to take it for both. And mm -hmm. um, and so they they um they put a lot of thought and they are very they are quite extreme. Um mm -hmm. and, and they're really they really they want to do the right thing. I mean, they think this is what God wants, and they mm -hmm. want everyone to do what God wants. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they they are, I mean, I, I it's one of those things where um, would I want to be kind of part of the community? And no, absolutely not. But they are trying to do what God wants. But whenever uh, a lot of sometimes they'll have this, you know, I'll meet someone who's like, we're kind of like a black hat or ultra orthodox, and they'll be like, oh, aren't they like? They're like conservatives, like with with a big C, right? They're they're conservative, like conservative dudes. I'm like, no, no, no. For them, we're the conservative dudes, right? Like they're keeping much more. They're being very strict. Right, they're, they're um, and they're and they're watching as other people are doing things, particularly in the temple, that don't, aren't up to their standards. It's not up to their standards, um, and they have a different, they have different a different rationale for what decides if something is correct or not, right? As opposed to at least what we know later on about the rabbinic thing, where there's a certain inc inclusivity that is important to the way you decide law in rabbinic arguments. So for example, things are much laxer when people are coming for the regalim for the three times you come you know, to the temple. They, they're like, oh, well, during that time, you can eat this or drink this, even though they might know they, because because we want people to be able to come, right? Like they'll, they'll do certain things where they're like, okay, well, in this case, we want people to be able to come to the temple. We want people to be able to kind of come up three times a year. So even if they're an Amha Aris, there's someone who doesn't know anything, right? We we allow certain things in that case. Um, and whereas for Kurma, that would be absolutely unacceptable. There are no exceptions, none. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, uh, that's it, it's an interesting, you know, kind of view of what, but again, but they're 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 trying to do they're kind, of, kind of they're trying to do the right thing. They don't understand why everyone doesn't realize they're right, and that mm -hmm. is one of their big uh, that's one of their big uh, issues. Okay, thank you. No problem. Any other questions, Miriam? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I the, the first half of the year I was uh, in the car on the cell phone and I was missing half of what you were saying. Uh, but um, you, you were saying that the Qumran community clearly rejected Yanai because Alexander Yanai because. Uh, he declared himself to be a Kohen. Oh no, 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 no! I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean that. I don't think they they. I don't think that they rejected him because of that. I think they rejected him because he didn't. He didn't. He didn't use their laws, right? I I don't. I don't think, and probably didn't, and also I think didn't. Uh, probably didn't do anything to help their community. Um, I don't think that they had a particular problem with Alexander Yanai in particular. I think their problem with the Hasmonean dynasty as a dynasty was that you've got these high priests who are not from the correct line. Right. I don't think this is a big argument that they focus on. Honestly, I, I and I, I should you know correct that I don't think that this is one of their huge problems with everything that's going on in the temple. That's not like their biggest concern. Because they've got, they've got another, uh, about a million other reasons to take to- uh, Yes, they have a lot of other reasons. So like when they write, um, when they write Miksad Maaseh Torah, when they write um, this document, um, which is in several copies, 
which is a, some of the some of the words of the law, which is the, which is the explanation to a Hasmonean king. This is why we split off, and we know you're righteous. So so maybe you'll understand and you'll side with us, even though it was probably never a letter that was sent, but it's written as a letter to a Hasmonean king that they really believe is righteous. And they're like, hey, you are good. So from we're, the, so we're telling you, we're community. explaining to you from the Qumran community, that's how it's framed, that th this, and this is why we split off. And the reasons they give are not, and you can't be a high priest. The reasons they give, and of course it's fragments. We don't have the whole thing. But from what we have in the fragments, the reasons they give are very specific halakhic reasons that have to do with the purity in the temple, hmm. right? That's what bothers them. The purity yeah. in the temple and the way sacrifices are brought, that's what bothers them, right? Um, and the question, again, there's, uh, in general, it's always been assumed also that, of course, the calendar, they would not have been able to to stay connected to the temple in terms of the calendar. That has been, our, Al Baumgarten has argued with that idea saying that it's much more of a I it's much more on the basis of an ideology and there are other cases so for example and I've said this before um um he brings the example you have rabbinic rabbinic and Karaite Jews who married each other right um and and we have the two boat in the Irogniza and they managed to make it work right you have it written down in the marriage contract each of them is going to respect the other one's holidays I don't know if that could have worked in the temple. But the question is, is that the reason why they had to split off? It certainly, it seems like it, when they, when they write about it, they write a lot. And, you know, yes, in their internal, in their darkness, they aren't trying to explain to other people. Um, they talk a lot, they talk about the calendar. This is what the calendar is. But the big things for splitting off seems to be much more purity loss. Purity loss seems to be a big deal. Purity. purity. Purity loss. Right. Yeah. You know, you have to be pure. You need, you know, how are you doing, how you bring a sacrifice, you know, this, this whole thing, the way you're doing the red heifer is clearly incorrect. Like all these things. Now, I, now they also have general laws that they have problems with. So for example, how can you marry two wives? Like I've said this before, right? Marrying more than one wife is not okay. Um, and they have to give an explanation for David because of course David's perfect because he write, writes the songs and everything. But, but they have to say, well, he, you know, um, but um, and not uh, to mention Solomon. He was punished for it. Yeah, like he, 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 he. It wasn't. It's but it's wrong. You're not supposed to have more than. You're not supposed to have more than one wife. You're not supposed to ma again marry your um, uncle. You're not supposed to. Um, they're you know they're they have different general laws that they're against. In terms of breaking out uh, from the temple, that's not affecting it. What's affecting it are purity laws. It, it seems uh, to be that they and very much have... holidays. And again, one assumes the calendar is also would it have to be an addition. Yeah. It, it seems very much that they had their own Torah Bel Peh that was very, very sacred to them. Right. Well, this is the thing. So you can't have, there is pretty much zero way to keep the, the Torah without some layer of interpretation. You can't do it. Like you need to interpret something, right? You have to have some kind of interpretation. There are things that are either clearly setting out general principles without the details. There are things that are clearly like there are absolute. You can't you can't do it right. So, for example, what is um what is a yom trua? What is a you know in in rabbinic tradition you blow the shofar. In I believe that in the Karai tradition you make a lot of noise. But you need some interpretation. You need to know what trua means, right? um what do you you know what do you uh you like there are all sorts of things that you must interpret in the torah so no matter what you have to have interpretation and one of my favorite examples of where you you know kind of i, I always bring it it, it, it it certain people don't find it very convincing i find it very convincing if you want to say well was there always oral law and so first of all in the ancient near east you didn't you didn't you didn't rule from law books the way you do today and even in like the Hammurabi's code, Hammurabi code, he's like, oh, you'll go for your court case and then you'll come and you'll find your, the, your law in my code, right? And it's very probable that this code was written based on court transcripts because a judge would, would rule not according to some written law, but according to kind of traditions of legal, you could call it jurisprudence, but according to oral law. But also if you read the Torah, right? So it tells you how to get divorced, right? You write a get kritut. But you write again. That's how you get divorced. It never tells you how to get married. 
Why? Because everyone knows how to get married. Everyone gets married. Everyone knows that. What they don't know is how you get divorced. Then you have to write that down, right? So the fact is there's clearly a way to get married. It just doesn't say it, right? It just tells you how to get divorced. So you can see that you must, must, must have stuff that's being passed down that's not written in the Torah. So um, it would it, yeah. it would seem that one of the big differences between sects like the Qumran sect and at least later rabbinic Judaism, it, they both they all have oral laws, but um, it's only in later rabbinic Judaism that you it, you get this this idea that machloket is okay, whereas in the earlier versions there was there was there was no tolerance for 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 machloket it seems. Oh, uh, that is a good point. Um, that is a very good point. Yes, and I think, but I think also, I think to be honest, it all, um, yes, yes. But in the final analysis, I mean, I agree. I agree, but that's also part of turning something oral into written. Because as long as things are oral, you can be like, okay, but this is a different circumstance. This circumstance is kind of different. And I know there's a tradition like this, a tradition like this, and this is the way they should interact because this is a different circumstance. As soon as you write that down, you have a choice. You can write one thing like the Rambam does, right? Or you can keep the argument about, well, what about this situation? Which is what we have in the top, right? So the Rambam is like, oh, we've got to boil it down. You need something, you know, okay, what, how do you rule? And, and today, right, we have books of halacha where I open it up. I don't want to read an argument. Right. I'm like, I put the spoon in the pot. What do I do now? Right. You all have that. Like, OK, can I use the spoon? Can I not use the spoon? Do I need to cash with the spoon? Just show me. Give me a book. Tell me what to do. Right. So <laughs> we all have things like that. But but when you're so when you're turning this kind of the judge is looking at things and trying to decide and you're writing that down. That's when in the Talmud, what you have is this argument and the Mishnah also to a certain extent, right? You have, you have the argument maintained, which is special, right? Which is special, but it's also, I think a function, and this is just me talking, right? I, I, I personally think it's a function of this kind of tr taking the oral and putting it in a written form, which is now codified in a way it wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be. Right. And there's a lot in the Talmud, which is which is trying to maintain that orality. Right. Which is this going back and forth, spelling things the way they sound. Right. You have a sanach and a sin are used interchangeably. Right. Like there's a lot of kind of orality that's maintained in the Talmud to kind of keep this flow and we don't know and okay so we rule according to this but there's also this opinion and then da, 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 you know and we have some stories written in you know if i didn't see it myself i wouldn't have believed it remember the frog that swallows the bird that swallows the bird. like you know you have all these things kind of just just flowing in to kind of keep that orality whereas it's very interesting i had a class with robert kawashima who he studied with alter um and he looked at the writtenness of the Hebrew Bible, how there's a kind of a written. So, for example, the um, the what we call vav ha'ipuch, you know, we have the vav in front of what they call the in, in, in academic speak, it's the preterite. It's not the future. Right. But it, it's a vav in front of the future and it turns it into the past. You will only have that in written. No one is ever going to say that in dialogue. Right. That's never a verb form that is used in dialogue ever. It's only written. And so there's a writtenness that's baked deep into the Chumash, into the Torah and into Tanakh, which makes it from its kind of from everything about it is written. Like it's it's kind of got a writtenness that's baked into it and the way it um, handles things. In fact, with the fact that we don't have a present tense, right, there is no present tense in biblical Hebrew, except in dialogue, we do see it because in, um, because Yosef says, I'm looking for my brothers. And he uses the present form, whereas everywhere else, right? In the present form is an adjective. You use an adjectival, it's, it's an adjective. It's not a present form. It's, um, so it's uh it, it, so anyway, there's a very big difference between the way the Torah and the Tanakh is written 
and that writtenness that's baked in to when we get to kind of the more oral things that are being translated into writtenness and in a way that's trying to kind of keep that oral sense. Really? Thanks for letting me talk about that. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> what, what makes you say that nobody spoke with the Vavaipu? How do you know? Well, we don't have it in any dialogue. There's never, you know, you never have a dialogue that's using Vavaipu. Uh -huh. Right, right. And, 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 and it doesn't seem to like, it's, it's, it's a way of narrative. Look, there's a, there's a tense, I forget. There's a tense in French that's like that. There's a tense in French that's only used in literature. You will never say it, right? It's a tense that's only used in literature. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not, you know, so that's a modern, you know, similar situation. It's it's not that weird to have something that you would only have in written form. Um, no, it's not, it's not that weird. I just wondered since we don't actually have any recordings of anybody talking. Oh, right. So we don't have recordings, but we do have, but that's the same thing where we are kind of saying, okay, but when it's, when it's quoting, when it has dialogue, where it should sound somewhat, it's more or less like dialogue. Now, of course, that also is a bit of a leap. Like if you say, I know, I know when I study Plato's Apology, we're like, was anyone actually saying these sentences? Because when you're working with a Greek in Plato's Apology, you actually have to draw like charts of how to read the sentence because this word belongs with that word over there because they're all in different forms that tell you what they do in the sentence. You they're literally like puzzles, right? The sentences are literally like puzzles in Plato's Apology, and we were like, did they actually say? Could they actually say these sentences and have people understand them? And the answer was no. They probably didn't say these sentences, right? And of course. Plato's apology is supposed to be spoken. It's all a spoken dialogue, right? But they said, no, no, it, this is, they could write this way, but they probably didn't speak this way. Um, um, but when we, but we do see that in, in biblical texts, there is a difference between dialogue and written, right? When, when there's a, there's the written narrative and then there's the quoted dialogue, which is very different. And again, we have that present tense when Yosef is speaking in that where norm, normally you would say, well, there is no, and that's in fact, one of the things that you learn is there's no present tense. There is there is a, a stative noun um, and an adjective, right? But it's not a present tense as such. What becomes the present tense later? You're like, but wait, here, there's a little piece of dialogue with present tense. So, what, so what maybe in dialogue, mean? they're using present tense. What do you mean by the there not being a present tense? What, I mean, when you say kotev, you say ani kotevet, right? I write. You right. don't have that in biblical. In late biblical Hebrew is going to be different. Late biblical Hebrew is, is different, okay? We're talking about classic, it's called classic biblical Hebrew. Um, it's generally a, a verb of I am doing this thing is going to be a, using a past tense or a future tense as a continuous future or whatever it is. It's, it's, not, it's not a... It's not supposed to be a present. So thank you for joining me, everyone. Um, and, uh, and I look forward to seeing you next week.